children. So let's go into the slide. Let me make sure I got this working right. If I get to slide one, then I know we on. Okay, so we know we on. Now, I put this one up because I wanted to show all of these symbols of religions. Whenever you go around the world, you see the Baha'i, you see the, the Buddhist and the Buddhist posture, you see the Buddhist wheel, you see the cross for Christianity, you see what they call the fish for Christianity, which is really uh, a symbol of a vagina, which was used in, in the ancient um, Tigris Euphrates system long before Christianity. We see the symbol for Confucianism. We see the symbol for the Judaic system, the Shinto Japanese system. Um, again, we see the, the Star of David or the Dog Star out of Kemet for the Judaic system. We see the Hindu system, Islamic system, the Sikh system. Everybody's system symbol for their system is there except the African symbol for their system. And I contend that the African symbol for what we are talking about that we call our spiritual system and our um, religion, the African symbol is a man, a woman, and a child. A man, a woman, and a child. Who we call in, in ancient Kemet, uh, Asar, Aset, and Haru. Who the whites have misunderstood, misrepresented, miscopied, called Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. And so that symbol of man and woman and child represent the continuity of life. You cannot have life unless you have two opposite sex that have an intercourse and a sperm and an egg is passed and you produce a replication of yourself, which is your eternity, because that is your future. And that must be constantly replicated in every generation in order for life to go on. And so that, as far as I can see, is the symbol that we projected to represent the greater part of how we understood reality. What we're looking at here is other people's symbolizing their understanding of the fragments that they drew from the periphery of our ancestors' understanding. So here we have, and I, I like this one, I would say the Egyptians were black and they had the world's first known writing system. And so as we look at the system, this is the Meduneta, this is what the ancient, the Europeans call the hieroglyph. Uh, does this have a pointer on it? Yes, but you can't show it on the TV. For okay. Some reason, so I'm going to get up. A... No, I'm going to get up with my hand and point to it with my hands. See how it is right here? Right, it but it wants to show on the screen. Right okay. So you need a different color is what you need. Yes. Now, if you look, now this is a, a writing system that's older than any other writing system in the world, except the ones down in ancient Sudan and in the, in, in the, the Great Lakes area, which, out of which this one comes. And so look here, the cross. Thousands of years before Christianity, there's the cross, which they claim they use as a symbol because of Jesus' dying. So just this one photograph shows that that whole concept is a fraud. So just to kind of get you started. So you can look with your eyes and see things, simple little things, you know, that people um, sort of like think they can say it because we don't have any information. But once you get a little bit of information, you go like, oh, something's wrong with that picture. And then we come here, the pyramid text, the oldest written religious text in the world. At least the oldest written religious text known to the world because they just entered the great mount in Sudan, uh, the, the great temple mount in Sudan, and they found a whole nother set of writing there that precedes and predates these writing. And I'm pretty sure that they were religious writing. But to us to date, the oldest known text is this one, in, the, in the, 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 the tomb of Eunice. But even here, it wasn't new. This was somebody repeating an older text. And so in this text, what the Europeans call the book of Genesis, much of the elements of what they call the book of Genesis is found in this text. Okay? And in this text, you find God saying, I created myself out of myself. I caused existence to exist so that I might exist. And then this God who is called Amun, the, the un, that which is unknown, then says, I hicker. 
And when he hicka, hicka means to vibrate. It means the same thing as the word. And I hicka and I produce others. So he produces pata. But look at pata now. No, first he produces ra. Now ra is symbolized by the sun. That means energy. And then he produces uh, pata. Pata is symbolized by a mountain. That means matter. So now I've produced matter and energy. And he came into being out of nun, which is water. So now you got water, you got matter and energy. And in, in noon, the noon out of which this God arrives is black and in darkness. So now you got darkness, but with Ra, you now got light. So out of the darkness into the light. So just like David looked at it later and said, let there be light. He says, I hicker and I created these. And then he said, I cough up Shu and I spat out Tefnut. Shu means the air. Tefnut means the moisture. And then Shu and Tefnut, which is is female and male, positive and negative, would produce twins. Those twins would be called the earth and the skies or the heavens, Geb and Newt. And then Geb and Newt would then give birth to the first humans. Then we're talking about a Sar, a Set, you know, uh, Set and Nephthys and on. So that Genesis story that they're using is our Genesis story. Okay? So that's what I mean when I say they are fragments from the periphery of our tradition. And then when God got through making everything, our God, meaning Amun, or whatever name we call him, Atum, whatever names are just descriptions of, of, of something, descriptions of characteristics of behavior. And then it says, having done all these things, having created all that my heart desired, I then expanded in it, which means... Everything that is, is also not only of me, but is me. So we are indeed, according to our tradition, God, the divine, having the human experience. Or more clearly put, we are expressions of aspects of the divine essence having the human experience. And this is what I was talking about. In the beginning, there's nun the primal waters, which one might even refer to as liquid matter. And then out of it would arise a tomb. And a tomb would be that unknowable factor that caused things to come into being. And then would arise a tomb ra, meaning the light, the energy, the radiation. And out of it it would give uh, birth to, to shu and tefnut, air and moisture. And then the air and the moisture and the energy would then give birth to what we call the earth all of the mineral resources that make up things and newt the sky meaning all of the elemental planets that's up there and this these will give birth to Nephthys, osiris isis and set who would then give birth to ra uh ra hator horus anubis and so forth meaning the human beings would come forth from the elements of the earth and the energies of the sky so all of what we put forth in our creation story is what they would copy in their creation story. So when they talk about Ad Adam, Adoma, they're talking about Geb. They're talking about the earth. And when they're talking about Eve, they're really talking about Newt. Adam means earth, ground, the, the minerals. And, and, and Eve means life, the energy force that come about as a result of the of 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 the minerals in in this earth. But why so, is it so hard for our people to really understand that? It's a great because thing. because this story. I know, but because we have to get familiar enough with it. I'm just getting familiar with it. I've been reading about this stuff for years, but I've been glossing over because Dr. Ben was teaching us. I didn't need to know it. I just listened to Doc. Um, now I'm watching brothers like Brother Reggie and others who have mastered this body of information. And so I'm trying now to catch up with the youngsters and trying to learn and understand this so I can explain it. Oh, yeah, I'm Roscoe, some bad dude. So, so I'm trying now to, I always knew it instinctively, but now I'm trying to look at it in detail so I can tell those of you who are listening to me, do the study, do it in details, and find out what each of these things mean. So they're not people. They're not gods walking around with animal heads. Those are metaphorical representation of ideas, principles, and concepts. Let me say that again. Osiris walking around as a mummy, 
being dead. There's no dead dude walking around with his dicks pointing out. Um, that's a symbol of, of, a, of a concept and a principle that is alive in every human being. Osiris is every human being. A set is every female human being. You understand? The, the children, their children are their qualities and attributes. Anubis, Haru, and so forth. These are the quality and attributes of what every human being is capable of expressing. So let's, let's go on. Um, this, the Per M. Haru, the book of the coming forth by day, or what the whites call the Egyptian book of the dead. This is chapter 17. And I just I put this in because I wanted to show, you know, I'm in Prince Hall Masons. People always jump and say, oh, the Masons, this and this. Stop listening to the, your ideas about white masonry that you've learned from white folks who hate white masonry. Go do your own research and find out what masonry is all about and where did it come from. And this symbol right here with the lion, uh, a leopard facing in different directions, this is just the concept that symbolized yesterday and tomorrow. And the light in the center, Ra, represents today. You know, just, and th that symbol is at the center of the Freemasonic teachings which come out of Kemet, not out of England, not out of France, not out of the Knights Templars. The Knights Templars and them steal this body of information from us and bring it back to Europe and repackage it like they've done Christianity, Judaism, and other things. This I put up, the Book of the Coming Forth by Day, is very important to see this little piece here. There's a lot in this papyrus. It's a fantastic papyrus. It has so much in it. But the little piece I was concerned with was to show you Brother, this is the papyrus of, An, uh, papyrus of Ani. Brother Ani has passed away. This is his soul, his ba, being uh, watching his spirit, being weighed. This is the feather of Ma'at, the feather of truth. This is his heart being weighed. His heart meaning his deeds, how he lived, how he spoke, how he acted, how he behaved on this earth. Being weighed, the energy that that has produced is what is being weighed against a feather. And that feather had better be lighter, mean heavier, than the, at, the energy that you produce on this earth. Because if you produce negative energy, it will be weighty. If you produce good energy, good character, good behavior, it would be light. And so you have Anubis, the, the, uh, the human body, and the jackal, the dog head. And there was no man in ancient Kemet that had a dog head. This is a symbol because the, the jackal was a dog that represents judgment. I mean, he would bury his meats in the ground and stuff and let it rot until it got just tender enough for him to go and dig up and eat and, and digest so it would do him some good. So he was referred to as the greatest symbol of judgment. So that's why he's using as the judge of the character of this man. And so here we've got this other person keeping a record, Tahuti. There's no person in the ancient came up with no bird head. There was a bird called the Ibis bird. And that bird, as it searched for worms in the marshland, it looks like it was writing. It leaves, if you see it today, it looks like, they like they're writing a whole letter. So it became the symbol of how we carry on calligraphy or writing. And so the, the, the human is recording the result of this man's character being judged against the principles that the society calls ma'at. That is the standard by which everybody should behave. You see, um, and looking at this and then listening to you, my brother, mm -hmm. we as African people, we look towards nature to give us the answer to things. We also right. look at the signs of the animals that, yeah, that right. we learn from we, we, the animals and we watch them. Right. You know? Na nature is not our enemy. That's the white man is at war with nature. The African is a part of nature. And that's why the white man is at war with the African. Nature is... And the cosmos is our dictionary, our encyclopedia, our Bible, our holy book. We imitate it because it is the perfection of creation so that we can be in tune with that perfectional function. And what the whites did, they would steal. And then this guy I got here, the hippopotamus, the lion, and the crocodile. Well, if you were on the bad side of things, you went here. 
this is about what the white man calls hell, you know, in his, his literature. And, and, but I'm calling him now the district attorney. And I'm calling this brother the court recorder. And I'm calling this brother uh, the judge. And I'm calling, you know, the brother who's bringing Mr. Ani through his attorney. And what we're seeing up here is the 12 jurors sitting in judgment. And then what we see in the laws of Ma'at here is the laws by which people are being judged. So what I'm saying is that this is the American and the Western legal system stolen right from one page of our book. And they don't even give us credit for it. And it's right in front of our face and we can't see it. They use our scale of justice. They use our lady Ma'at as justice. They use her bandana from around her head to put over her eyes. And, and we still don't get it. They've taken our whole system and make us think we don't have nothing. And they've got this great democracy and this great legal apparatus that we need to learn from when it's nothing but a fragment from the periphery of your system. The Coffin Text is the third oldest written holy book. Again, this is us. And I wanted people to be clear. Here the priest and the priestess, and they just black as they can be. So, Professor you know? Smalls, I'm sorry to keep cutting you off, but I want to yes, give sir. our people a good and clear sight. Mm -hmm. Where were the Hebrews? There, the they, there was no such thing. They don't Where were the Moors? They, the there's no such thing. There was no Christianity, there's no Moors, there's no Hebrews, there's no Islam, there's none of this stuff. No, not, this no not at this time. That's why I'm saying Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is fragments from the periphery of this practice that we had going on hundreds of thousands of years before they so stumbled on the that scene. The Hebrews was not in Kemet? They was not in Egypt? They, they, they're nowhere in our history. They're nowhere to be found. And we have the best kept history in the world to date. And the best preserved history in the world to date. And how would we not preserve something as extraordinary as the event they claim took place? So I try not to give too much credence to it other than to say that these people stole fragments from the periphery of this system. You see the priest with his leopard skin. You remember when I did Dr. Ben? I tried to simulate some right. leopard skin That's over awesome. my white robe. Yes. So, and here's the priestess with the leopard skin and they're coming to 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 consecrate uh the mummy the symbol of the body having been dead and is now being preserved for posterity and this is another page from the coffin text so we have the pyramid text we got the coffin text um we we've got the book of the coming forth um, this is the 11th hour of the Book of Gates. This is the fourth oldest holy written books. Now, these are all of our holy books written. There is no Bible yet. There is no Torah yet. There is no Koran yet. And here is all of these texts that we have written talking about life, talking about time. If you would account these, you would see we were already into the 24 hours. We were into the 12-hour cycle. We were already into the 365-plus uh, days of the year. We were already studying the stars, studying the relationship between the stars and other things here on Earth, studying the relationship between man and energy from around the cosmos, our interrelationship with life and death. We realized that there was no such thing as death, that we both matter and energy and neither can be destroyed. We knew that way back then. We knew that when we had our babies that we did not have babies we simply recreated ourselves as an extension of ourselves so each child that comes out of a human being is that human being deposited themselves into the future that's our culture again and from the book of gates another page i just want to show we had these books another the second from the book of gates i'm not going to go into the detail and this, when we talk about the primordial waters of Nun, they use this symbol um, of a human being as water to symbolize the waters of Nun. The waters of Nun is, is, uh, is that thing out of which all things come into being. And in the book of the coming forth by day, our God created force said, and having created everything in the world and having then um, deposited myself in everything, I then realized that I came forth from my mother, Nun. So the African Amun and Atum and Atum Re says that they came forth from a woman and that the woman or the feminine 
element in nature was the ultimate deity. I didn't say that. Our ancestors say that there's no book older on this subject than that. God Amun, the hidden one. There was no God looking like this that had this little gold crown on. This is the conception of the mind of an African. If God was a human being, this is the way God would look. Like them. Okay? So this is the African projecting God in their image. So they said if God Amun was to be on earth as a human, this is the way God Amun would look. Awesome. And another uh, golden statue of the God Amun. God, what they call the, and I have the Antiar, that's Kut, Antiar, the Netter, which we call God, Netter God, uh, represent the darkness. Now, Kut was the opposite of boundless. Now, so, in, and these are just concepts in the character and the essence and nature of what we would call divinity. So first we know the, the divinity was in what we call darkness. And then we know that the divinity was boundless. It has no beginning. It has no end. It didn't start anywhere. It isn't going to end anywhere. So net, kut, and net, and, uh, and kut, and, and, and um, the, this net, the, the boundless, was, the, was two of the most powerful elements of the divine as we thought them out. And this is the symbol of light. Ra, you know, represented by a human with a falcon head with the sun on top. But on top, the sun is surrounded by a snake that, that has called itself in a circle, represent 360 degrees or infinity, meaning there is no beginning, there is no end. Is sun or Heru? No, this, this, this is Heru, Heru Ra. Right, right. Okay, when you see this is Ra. So this is the symbol. The falcon is used because the falcon was a bird that can fly up into the sky and it looked like it just disappeared into the sun. It looked like it just disappeared into the sun. And the sun represented the source of an energy without which we would all die. So they were the symbols of the great divinity. And of course, this is the god Ptah. I love Ptah because his skin is always black. He got his little afro hanging up there and, he, and he's my man. And Ptah is the architect of the universe. He represents the primordial hill, the matter, the things we use to build all the things that we build. So if you find in Freemasonry, they will always refer to secretly Ptah, but in the open they call it the great architect of the universe. But once you get into the secrets, they'll tell you that this is Ptah. And all they're doing is talking about the concept of what is necessary to build that which will sustain the human family in an orderly way, in a civilized way, so that they can recreate themselves for posterity and for eternity. And this is a symbol of Shu and Tefnut. Shu represent air, which is a, a brother sitting on the throne with a feather, almost like Ma'at. And then Tefnut, who is a sister, symbolized by a lion with the energy and the power of Ra on her head. And so Shu and Tefnut, air and moisture, would then produce the earth. You know, the, uh, to, again, this is uh, Tefnut, which is moisture and the wife of Shu. And they would produce they, Geb and Nut. Um, they would produce, Geb, this should be reversed. Geb should be the earth and Nut should be the sky. So that's my bad. Um, but remember, Geb is the earth. All the minerals, zinc. Iron, uh, cobalt, all of the diamonds that go, all the silver, all the minerals that's in this earth is in the human body. You know, we made up of all those minerals. And then the energy from all the stars and the skies and the sun is in our body. And we made up of those in though though the energy and those minerals make give us oh, life. Before you go on. Yes. So family, let's correct it. Like yeah. so the brother will tell you. Reverse it. Yeah. Gab is at earth, the bottom, and Newt is at the, at the top. top. So, right, so y'all don't say brothers. Earlier, yeah. We only hear we make right. mistakes, but <laughs> so, we Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this one, now we get into the concepts, principles, and ideas that we are familiar, more familiar with. And the first Madonna and child worship along the Nile, 
Aset, the Holy Mother, and Harud, the child born of Immaculate Conception, to Asar, the Divinity. And you see sisters sitting with her breast in her hand where she's giving nutrient and nurturing to the child. And the third piece of this is the father who is Asar. And that's why I'm saying the symbol of our divinity is the mother, child, father, or the mother, father, child. And it is this symbol that will become throughout the Western world the Mary Jesus symbol, the, the Madonna child symbol. And they will not make any reference back to this African symbol, which is a hundred and hundreds of thousands of years older than them. Matter of fact, on the 11th of September every year, this concept is celebrated in Ethiopia as the Ethiopian New Year. It is the biggest celebration in Ethiopia. And this is Asar. Look at them. This is the way we carved them back in the day. We knew we was black, so our God could only be black. This is the way we saw Asar looking. And he's carrying the shepherd's staff that later Christ would carry because this would become the Christ character in the Christian tradition. And this obelisk, which we see in Washington, D.C., a copy of it in Washington, D.C., is the symbol of this Tekanu, which in our metaphor, when he was killed and lost his capacity to produce, that woman was able to cause him to get a hard on like granite stone. And he then was able to reproduce God itself. So it is saying that we, we never die. This is about no death no death and that all of what we call death is simply uh, uh, a spirit in transition always resurrecting itself and this became the ultimate symbol of that resurrection and of course I love this one because it's the 12 divine disciples of God on earth or the original 12 disciples known as the Netaru so before the, they took our symbols of Aset and Asar, Mary and Jesus, I mean Aset and Haru, Mary and Jesus, and then Asar as the Christ adult. Then they gave him 12 disciples. Well, before that, we had the 12 disciples. Haru, Set, Thor, Kanum, Hathor, Sebek, Ra, um, Amun, Ptah, um, Anubis, Asir, and Aset. So here is the 12 disciples. And, and, and when you look at the, at the name of the 12 that they ascribe in their metaphor, because the story of Jesus is not a true story. That's a metaphor, a European Western metaphor based on your metaphor. This is us trying to explain nature to ourselves and how it functions in the laws. And each of these 12 qualities and attributes or multiple sets of quality and attributes in each one is present in the human character as a possibility of human development. And if you understand that that's what religion and spirituality is supposed to do is give you the tool to develop within your character any one of these multiple strengths that we call the netters. And they call disciples. The ancient Egyptians, of course, were black. And I put this picture up because it's so beautiful um, with this sister with her locks. And they weren't called dreadlocks. Dread is a British word. The British didn't exist yet. The English language didn't exist yet. So they couldn't have been called dreadlock. Dread is a British word that means fear. And in Jamaica, where they encountered in another parts of the Caribbean, the priest class that was waging war of independence out of slavery, they all wore their hair in locks then as they do in Africa today. And the British said, we dread the lock-haired ones. And from that, we got the dreadlocks. You know, but it was the white man saying, we dread the lock-haired ones. But you can see the lock-haired ones was there from the beginning of time. And of course, we didn't have no comb or brush. The hair would naturally dread or lock. Sorry, see how I made the same mistake? <laughs> so, now this is a painting from the tomb of Ramses III, 1200 BCE. It shows that the Egyptian perceived themselves as black and represented themselves as such without possible confusion with the Indo European and the Semites. This is a representation of the races in minute detail which guarantees the realism of the colors throughout the entire history. The Egyptian 
never dreamt of representing themselves by type B or D. This is B, the Asiatic type, and, and, and D, the, the, so, the European type. And this comes from the book by Shek Diop, Civilization of Barbarism, by Shek Diop on page 66. So the Egyptians saw themselves as black, and this is on the wall of the tomb. And they saw the rest of the Africans looking just like them and it was just as them. They saw the Asiatic type or the Eurasian type looking like this. And they saw the European type looking like this. And they painted on the walls. And they left it there to this day. So let's not be confused anymore wondering who was who and what was what. This is a scene. <coughs> excuse me. Like that, yeah, I could use a little water. Um, this scene comes from the wall of a temple in the Sudan, and this predates the um, what, what we call the um, the dynastic period in Kemet. There's a kingdom in the Sudan called Karma. It is a civilization that that loaned itself to the civilization that would expand and become Kemet. So before there was a Kemet in the north. There was this civilization already functioning for thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of years earlier in the south. You see the leopard skin across the arm symbolizing that this is a priest. They're bringing wealth and gold and, and symbols. You can see that we weren't just brown today. We were black then and brown then. We didn't get brown because of the white man. We were brown and black from the earliest time. The brownness came out of our blackness. And so we ought to be clear when we play with ourselves in these conversations about who we are. Mm. Excuse me, but the water is good. And so I won't go deep into karma, but we need to learn more about the ancient civilization in Sudan. I'll be going to Sudan this summer. I'll be visiting karma for about a week and the great temple mount, Jabril, in, in the Sudan. Hopefully I can get some good photographs to come back with. Abydos, the oldest city of Upper Egypt, 5,000 to 3,100 B.C. Now, I put this enormous temple there because when this Abydos is built with these beautiful, powerful temples, mm -hmm. with these powerful pillows, there is no Greece yet. There is no Rome yet. There is no Ionic civilization. There is no Doric civilization. This is just the black folks being black folks doing a black thing about black folks. So we didn't borrow this concept of the pillar temple from the Greeks because there is no Greeks yet. And we didn't borrow this from the Romans because there is no Romans yet. None of them exist yet. There's still barbarians in the mountains and of the Caucasus Mountains and other parts of Europe. This I wanted to show the enormity of the Grand Temple or the Grand Lodge of Waset. Look at this thing. It starts here. This is one complex. You could take the Parthenon and fit it in here 20, 30 times. Yet they stick this little Parthenon, this little square with some pillows up on a hill. But this thing you can see is one block, two blocks, three blocks, four to five city blocks long if not longer. And you can see it, did, it expanded beyond itself. If you can see, there's a small group of little pillars here. This is where the Greek built something, trying to build something after they conquered Kemet. And this little mess that they built fell down already. This is what our ancestors built thousands of years before they got there. You know, and all of this is a part of the complex. And then if you came out the front door and walked for a mile, you would get into the great Karnak temple, which is bigger, even bigger than this one. And the whole complex itself was called Ipet Isut, which was the university complex in which our people learned the seven liberal arts, which we had invented long before there was a white man. We invented the seven liberal arts. You know, that's reading, writing, geometry, arithmetic, rhetoric, um, music, and I'm missing one, but it, it'll come. So here we are. When this is built, there's no white man. There's no Greece. There's no England. There's no France. There's no Rome. There's no Christianity. None of this. There's no Judaism. There's, 
Uh, algebra is a part of it. No, I'm but, yeah, and, but it, no, but that's not one of the seven. Oh, okay. Algebra fits under arithmetic. Oh, okay. okay. So, but we already had algebra because if you go to the Rhine Mathematic Papyrus, you see we were, I think it's problem 16 or, or one of them said we were solving problems with two or more unknowns. And when you're dealing with solving a problem with two or more unknowns, you're talking about algebra. Of course, they would later, later name the concept after some Arab. This is another beautiful temple, uh, the Pharaoh Hatshepsut Burial Temple in Daryl El Bahir. This is, temple is built right out of the mountain. You couldn't do this today. The engineering feat to carve this facility out of the side of this mountain is absolutely extraordinary. And the science and the math and the geometry and the trigonometry and the algebra that you would need to do this is enormous. And there's no computers. And with computers, they couldn't replicate this. And Sir, Sister Hatshepsut was not the first female pharaoh. She just became one of the most famous ones. Shushank I of the 22nd dynasty is thought to be the biblical Shushak mentioned in the Book of Kings. And you can see this is a statue of him. They mentioned him in the Book of the Kings. You can see this is a young African pharaoh, the leader of the greatest nation on earth at that time, the nation we call today Kemet. And this is Pharaoh Tahaka, son of Shabaka, succeeds in driving the Assyrian invaders out of Egypt. He's the only Pharaoh mentioned, I should say, mentioned by name in the Bible. And this is Taharka mentioned in the book of Isaiah. And, 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 and in, the, in the Torah, in the book of Isaiah, they talk about a chronicling about this king named Taharka. And, and they have Isaiah, their prophet, referring to him to the other Israelites that he is king of Egypt and all the world. That's in deep. The in the Bible, king of Egypt and all the world. And for the, the Israelite not to get in this path trying to play any guerrilla warfare with them because he was going to drive the Assyrian invaders out of the land and save the Israelis. The Israelites. They didn't call themselves so Israelis. People got. Skip over oh, they skip over anything that's black. <laughs> and as you can see, this is a young black man. He could be right there on 141st Street and 7th Avenue walking around. Mm -hmm. But then. He was the Pharaoh of Egypt. In Deuteronomy, on the fourth chapter 9 from the, the New International Version of their Bible, it says, only be careful and watch yourself closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live, meaning your history. That's the things your eyes have seen. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So how dare these people tell us not to teach our history, not to teach black history, not to teach African history, and the very book they claim they're worshiping, tell them to do just that. Now Canaan, the land that they call Palestine or Israel today, this is Canaan, the God El, and a Canaanite woman. Is that black enough for you? You know, and look at the God. Is he black enough for you? And this is the God of the Canaan people before the crackle. And, and, and they lie to us and tell us like they don't know who the Canaanites were. These are some exile Hebrew musician relief from Nineveh, 678 B.C. I hope you can see it well enough that these are clearly African men with these nose and these lips. And they're wearing their hair in the locks. And then we go to the next one. These are ancient Hebrews being taken into captivity by the Assyrians from the palace wall at Sennacherib. And this is from 680 B.C. Again, you can see the, the Assyrians are white. They got long hair. And then you can see the, the Hebrew captives have nappy, round, little round, dotty hair. So, um, you know. That is a group of Africans. We can go into detail, but I think Brother Reggie and them have handled that very well. I'll leave that to um, Brother Polite. But I just wanted to show you the symbol that just like the Moors were black people, the Hebrews were black people, the nation of Kemet were black people, the nation of Karma were black people, and now crackers have begun to seep down into our land with their war machines, and we're getting captured. An Ethiopian Hebrew today living in, in, in Ethiopia, you can see how she looks. And this, this, I put this up, this is the Temple of Solomon that supposed this is only a, an artist's recreation of what this temple must have looked like. 
I put it up because these two pillows in front is the symbol of all Masonic lodges in the world. You will not walk in a Masonic lodge except that you walk between the two symbols. And I'm not supposed to be at liberty to tell you what the symbols are, but you can go on any good uh, research on, on the Internet and find uh, Masonic lodges and see that they're replicated from these things. Now, this is the Queen Makeda, uh, or who they call the Queen of Sheba. This is one of the oldest pictures I can find. And wherever you find a picture of her, she's always painted as a black woman. The, this is the ruins, supposed to be the ruins of the Queen of Sheba, or the palace of Makeda in Ethiopia, uh, that's being excavated. By now, they should be finished with the excavation. I did have the opportunity to visit the site and walk through this site. It's a massive site. Um, so, and it is good our people to begin to do the archaeological work necessary to excavate our ancient history. Someone in the chat room asked a question and they said, mm -hmm. how did we fall? Yeah, one, someone asked the question, how did we fall? We came up against animals. We came up against people who came out of war cultures. We came up against people who didn't love human life, who didn't believe in the divineness of the human being. And for the, for the want of things, for the want of some gold, for the want of some wheat or barley, they were willing to murder human beings. So they came upon us with a war culture and the war machine with spears and arrows and swords, things we didn't yet have. We would get those things and go back at them, but we would never become as good a killers as they are because their value in human life versus our value in human life is completely different. And that's why they just came in and slaughtered men, women, and children. That was something we couldn't do. You know, in the war, even when, when um, Brother um, Ramses and Brother, um, mm, oh, the, the, the brother of, um, of Hatshepsut, uh, even when they took the war all the way back to Turkey, they gave them peace. It's okay, we done whipped your ass now. Stay home in your land with your people in peace. We're going to even give you some food and other things if you're hungry, and that's why you come to fight us. But we came up against a culture of murderers. We came up against a culture of rapists, a culture of barbarians. If there's a good book, um, Michael Bradley, um, The Iceman Inheritance, we must all read that book um, because he talks about who the white man really is. This is a guy, when he's in the cave, during the ice age, when the snow came and he couldn't find no food, he ate his women. He ate his women. And there's proof of this because the human bones, the female human bones found in the cave had female human teeth marks in them. So they ate the old women first and when they ran out of old women, they ate the other women. That's why they were screwing each other in the butt to find pleasure instead of having pleasure out of the beauty of a female. And so when we're looking at a culture of animals, a culture of barbarians, they have cleaned up because they've learned so much from those things I showed you in our culture. They've learned so much from us on how to clean themselves, wash themselves, use soap, dress right. But that behavior, that hasn't changed. That's why he's still making nuclear bomb and neutron bomb and, and biological weapons and shooting us down in the street and killing our sisters in the prison and all these things. The same barbarian is still in the head. It just looks different today. That's why we lost. But we haven't lost. The degree to which we lost is the degree to which the fear have us wanting to be like them. The fear of them having us wanting to be like them. When we learn about our own history, when we learn about our own divinity, and we lose the fear of dying, and lose the fear of them, and stop wanting to be like them, they will die. They're only one-ninth of the world's population. They only live because we are sucking at their titties and have them sucking at ours. When we stop that process, they will die. Matter of fact, all white nations, America included, right now is at minus birth rate, meaning more of their people are dying from natural death than they can give natural birth to. That's why they have so many pills and machines and all kinds of giving these artificial birth, adopting and kidnapping other people's children to infuse their blood system with melanin to keep themselves going. But we need to just pull away. We need to stop trying to imitate them. Stop trying to be like them. We're going to be better murderers than them. Better dope dealers than them. Better profanity than them. Better killers than them. Then how can we kill them if they have become us? And so that's what the spiritual warfare we are now is about. That's what this discussion is about. Is that our spirituality should trump their barbarism. 
the ancient city of Aksum in Ethiopia. It is in this complex here that this thing that the, the so-called Hebrews called the Ark of the Covenant, which they can't produce for nobody, the Ethiopians said they can't produce it because we got it. And in and, and each of the Ethiopian temples is another um, picture of that same, the modern part of that temple. And this is a close-up of the temple where they say this ark is being kept. There's a big electric fence around all of this, which we can't see in the photos. And soldiers with machine guns and stuff that guards it. So they got something up in there that they're not letting the world into. Um, and in each of their temples, their, their churches, what they call their mother churches, they have a replica of that ark in the Holy of Holies, where only the priests can go. I put this here because we wanted to look at it again, re-familiarize re ourselves, especially because tomorrow is going to be Good Friday. And last week you had Palm Sunday. And next Sunday you're going to have Easter. So this is the original African mother and child. This is the Ethiopian version of the black mother and child. And this is what we got coming out of Europe, the white mother and child, which have now been imposed on the whole world through the barrel of a gun. In the history of Christianity in ancient Africa, St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt, which is south of Sinai, is 335 A.D. You remember, it's, it's 325 A.D. when they come up with the Bible, right? When they start writing the Bible, they really don't come up with it for another 70 years or so. So here's this monastery, which is already there, and they don't even have a Bible yet. So what's this about? What are they teaching then? So they're teaching the same comedic body of information, and they're breaking it down um, to fit this modern people that have now invaded our lands via the invasion of, this, of the Hitsa, first the Hyksos, 1700 BC, and then the Hittites, and then following the Assyrians, and then that's following the Persians, and that's followed by the Greeks, and that's followed by the Romans. Well, none of them ever go back home after being defeated, so the remnants of these people are now in our land and our elders and priests is trying to interpret our body of knowledge in a format to teach it to these invaders children who are now being born and grown up in our land for centuries. You know? And then there's another great building, the ancient Coptic church and the elders, which is the eldest of all Christian church. Now the ancient Coptic church today is headquartered in Egypt. And I'm going to show you something on the next slide that should help your mind understand the ancient Coptic church came about when Constantine called the Nicene Conference and called many of the brothers who was teaching this African spiritual wisdom together that was now under the Roman uh, invasion and domination to try to put together a document that would be common for the entire Roman uh, um, uh, Empire. And that document turns out, comes out to be what we call the Bible today. And according to the Pope before this Pope, seven of the ten men writing that document were Africans. And so the Coptic Church, a brother named Arius and his followers, break away from that discussion in, in Nicaea that Constantine is having because they disagree with the notion that Jesus is the Son of God and born to the earth and God came down and walked as a man. They said that was ridiculous. They disagreed with that. Um, their concept was that all human beings have the potentiality of the divinity. And so they uh, escape and they go back, they make it back to Egypt. Arius, their leader, will be murdered later on, but the movement that becomes known as the Coptic Church continues till this day. Now this is the Coptic Church. Christ and his disciples being depicted as African. This is one of the oldest painting of Christ and his disciples anywhere in the world, and it is in the Coptic Museum in Cairo. So just spend a little minute marinating on that since this Easter thing is popping up. So here's how the Africans, before the Bible was even finished being written, depicted their teacher, who the West would later call the Christ, and depicted those who were the disciples of that teacher who would carry on his teachings. And this is in the museum, the Coptic Museum in Cairo. You can go see it today. There is no white painting of Christ yet anywhere in the world. There's no white painting of the Last Supper of Disciples anywhere in the world. 
for another 500 years. This is another picture from the Coptic Museum. This is the conception by righteous Anne. Anne is the most holy mother of the God. Saint Anna the, is the mother of the Virgin Mary and was the youngest daughter of the priest Nathan from the Bethlehem descended from the tribe of the Levites, you know. And the Levites, you know, of course, these are the people who were the priest class. And so in the African picture, there ain't no white version of Jesus yet anywhere in the world. In the Coptic Museum, this is Jesus, the black man with his fro, and this is his grandmama. Okay, Anne. And he's given, you know, giving her a hug. And this is how African is painting their metaphorical representation of their teacher before the crackers take it and turn it into their thing. And you can go to uh, Cairo today, you can go to the Coptic Museum today, and you can see these paintings and many, many others. I thought this was such a beautiful scene. This is Ethiopian Christians um, celebrating, uh, I think, the spring, the coming of spring, which the West call Easter. And so I just thought it was such a beautiful piece, you know, them doing this, because when they're doing their thing, there is no Catholic Church yet. There is no Protestant Church yet. There's no Luther Reformation yet. You understand what I'm saying? There's no Methodist. There's no Baptist. There's no Episcopal. There's no Catholic. None of that stuff exists. And yet we are celebrating this tradition, which goes back to ancient Kemet. And the metaphor that's expressed by Haru and his mother, Aset, metaphorical mother, Aset, and father, Asar, which comes from the pyramid text story of the beginning of creation. Um, let me say this real quick. Yes, sir. Um, do you have a PayPal account? Yes. I want you to give that PayPal account first, real quick, before you finish. Um, what I want to say is that we have 547 people watching the live stream. What I'm going to ask you, my family, is that out of 547 people watching this live stream, will you, be, will you be kindly enough to drop $1, just $1, into Professor Small's PayPal account? Think about that right there. See, we don't have to jump out the window and say, oh, he wants 20 he wants 10 No, just $1 out of the 547 people that's watching and we could raise money for Professor James Smalls to do a little something with it and that will be at least 500 I would say 547 I don't expect everybody to do it but for those of y'all who are watching we are just asking for one dollar to go into Professor James Smalls PayPal account brother before you continue let them know how to do that and I want you to call me and see if our people responded, brother. Let me know what you have received out of a donation from our people that's watching. Give it to them okay. first. Yes, sir. I, I do have a PayPal account, and the email is C S M A L L. Say it again. C S M A L L. C small, nineteen twenty six at aol dot com. So that's C. S M A L L small 1926 at AOL.com. It would be helpful. I'm trying to get to Ghana now. Most people don't know that me and Dr. Jeffries and about 60 other brothers and sisters have a 30 room hotel complex for the last 10 years that we've been struggling to keep going. The Ebola has hurt us really bad, but we're coming back. Um, and I need to get over there and do some work and some painting and some other things and just supervise and try to raise some money through the banks over there so we can keep it going. It is a beautiful retreat for anyone from the diaspora want to come. Um, we, our prices are flexible. We, we make our price fit what you can pay. Um, it's called the Sana Lodge in Cape Coast, Ghana, a wonderful place. And the word Sana means the place from which one does not leave until your task has been accomplished. And so I hope that you can give the one dollar any way that you can help. It would be wonderful. Um, but learn, please, from what I'm doing and research what I'm saying. Go and do your due diligence. 
but I'm trying to give you enough information about Christianity before the white man stole it from us. Now, we didn't call this Christianity then. This was just our culture. It was just our spiritual way of being. And the stories were just our metaphor to teach our concepts, ideas, and principles to ourselves. So let's come back to this, because this is an important building. I had an opportunity to visit this building and go in this building. It's called St. Mary of Zion Church. It's the oldest church in Ethiopia, one of the 10 oldest churches in the world. Okay? The Crackers ain't got no church in England yet. France, Germany, Spain, none of that stuff yet. Italy, no churches yet. And this is the church of St. Mary of Zion, the oldest church in Ethiopia, is one of the 10th oldest churches in the world. And it's there because when Christianity is not an Ethiopian phenomenon, this brand of it, what we know as the Benzantian Empire, those part, that part of the Roman Empire, who took the work that was initially done um, by the people at the Nicaea Conference, the Nicaean Conference, and they established what we know today as the Eastern Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church. And that church then was part of what was called the Benzantian Empire. That was the Roman Empire once it became Christianized, but it wasn't called Christianity yet. Okay? And so one of their leaders coming down the, Nile, the Red Sea, the king boat sank and the king died, and his son was rescued by the Ethiopians and raised for some years by the king of Ethiopia along with the prince of Ethiopia. When the boy got old enough and returned back to what is now Turkey, but was then Byzantium, and he then introduced, reintroduced this religious form to his friend, who the prince of Egypt, who was now the king of Egypt, as he was now the king of the Byzantium Empire. And that's how this church in this form got started in Ethiopia. But even at this point, as, as it's being developed as the early Christian church, there is no Roman Catholic church yet. The Roman Catholic church would emanate out of this church. Okay? And I'll show you that on a graph in a few minutes. But what makes this church important, the queen mothers of Ethiopia says, no, this is not our form of how we look at our culture spiritually. This is a foreign way of looking at the culture. So they burned all the churches in Ethiopia down. And this was the only one that was saved by the king. And so that's what makes it significant. So till this day, they don't allow any women to enter this church because the women burnt it down. But as a male, I was allowed to go into the church. And that's when I saw a sixth century painting of the Madonna and Child, black and as beautiful as can be. The Madonna is wearing, is wearing a blue dress with gold trim. The child is wearing white with gold trim. And it was a, a tapestry over six feet tall from the 6th century. Michelangelo, great-grandmama, wasn't born yet. And he paints the first one in Europe. This is the 5th century Byzantine church foundation in Ethiopia. So if you're talking the 5th century, the Catholic church don't exist yet now. You all understand me. So you'll understand what I'm talking about with Christianity in Africa before it's in Europe. But we have a different form. And if you go look at what's going on in Ethiopia, there's nothing in Europe that resembles what's going on in Ethiopia. And after the Byzantine Empire falls, the Ethiopians will fall under the leadership of the, of the Egyptian Coptic Church and will stay under the Coptic Church until the 20th century. When under Haile Selassie, they will establish their own, or under Menelik, they begin to establish their own bishop in partnership with the prelate from uh, Egypt, and then under Selassie, they will establish their own autonomy from the Coptic Church of, of Egypt. This debris, uh, Berhan Selassie Church in Gondor, Ethiopia. I got to visit this beautiful church. And uh, their metaphor and stories are painted from the floor to the ceiling. Every inch of the church is painted in the story of their belief system. And all of what they interpret as the Bible, which is a different interpretation than what we interpret, is on the ceiling and the wall. This is their hieroglyph. Okay. And all the churches, they have this. It's just magnificent, especially all the old ones. 
And this is how we carved the churches right out of the side of the mountain, our place of worship. Because we didn't call it churches because church is an English word that simply means community of believers in God. It doesn't mean that building. The church is, I think it's a Greek word. It means community of believers. Okay. And this one, this is the church of St. George in Lalibela, Ethiopia. When the queen mothers burnt down all of the churches around Ethiopia, the king moved his kingdom up into the mountain, a place called Lalibela, where there was only one small pass into the kingdom. Even today, you could only get up there on this one small narrow road. And so he then built these churches down in the ground, carved out of solid rock so it wouldn't be seen. And thus, they would have an opportunity to rebuild. He built 11 of them, I think, or 12 before uh, you know, anybody could come in and burn them down and break them down. And that's how Lolly Bella came about. It wasn't that they were trying some great engineering feat. This was out of necessity. How do we create these places of worship without having it burned down to the ground by our traditional leaders? And this is it from the sky. I've been down in here. It's magnificent. You walk through this pathway in the rocks you go down some steps and you come out this door right here and you go inside and it is an absolute temple and cathedral in there just carved out of a solid piece of rock oh they built that like down in the ground they didn't build it they right. just they just they didn't build it they just see? carved it right. see how they that's carved that that's right they carved wow. it right out of the rock that's one of 11 they got 11 12 of them down in the earth, down in the earth out of solid rock right. you know that's, this is one piece. Okay. And they carved out the inside. So it's, it's look like any other cathedral. Carved out the windows and the doors. You know, it's magnificent. You got to go there. And this is another one in the mountains, in the side of the mountains. Just to show you our fit. This is a 6th century castle at Gondor, Ethiopia. I just thought I'd throw this in so we know that we didn't learn how to build castles from England and Robin Hood and, 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 the, and the 40 Thieves or King Arthur. They learned it from us. Okay. These are other castles in Ethiopia that predates any other castles in England. So when they start talking about their castles and stuff, we know where they got it from. And this is Hathor Temple at Naga, Sudan, 2000 BC. And I'm going there to Hathor because when we think of Hathor, Again, you got to start thinking of Mary, you know, the symbol that becomes Mary in the Christian tradition. Then we go to this place called Old Dungala, 11th century A.D., Christian community. This is what important, it's important there. This is the church of the granite column at Old Gundala, Sudan in East Africa. Now, Sudan was one of the biggest Christian community before the Muslims invaded and destroyed most of the churches. But Africans are excavating their temples that predated the Islamic mosque um, so that they can restore their history. Hopefully I can make it there this summer when I go into Sudan. This is the remains of an 11th century church at Bagnati, Sudan. Look at the enormity. They're just excavating this thing. This is 11th century. Look at the enormity of these pillows and what must have been above ground that these things were holding up. There is no transatlantic slave trade yet, right? Islam is just developing hundreds of miles away, but have not invaded our lands yet. And so the, the Catholic Church has just come into being, so we ain't talking Catholicism. That ain't what this is, all right? This is our version of what they will call Christianity. And this is the Benzantian, I just in early Russia. I just kind of want you to see that there was something going on. While we're down in Africa doing our thing, you have the German invasions coming into Europe. And the German invasion starts way over here in the Caucasus Mountain, you know, and, and these are known as the Ostrogoth and the Visigoth. They will go all the way through Spain, invade North Africa, attacking the Roman Empire. Okay? This is before the Muslims come. This is before the brothers who history we talk about as the Moorish Empire would rise. These German crackers would invade at North Africa, and many of them still have their remnants living there until this day. That's after the Romans had sat on us for hundreds of years in North Africa and had again bastardized our people in North Africa, people we call in Arabs and so forth today. And so I just want, while we are, and this is the 11th century, you got trade from Western Rome and trade from the Middle East, India, and China. You got 
this is what this whole thing is about with white folks. It's not about religion. It's about capturing these trade routes so that they can make money to build their empires in the same way we saw these murderers in Brussels who just had a bad day a few days ago who killed 25 million Congolese and helped to murder Patrice Lumumba and now they're crying because the chickens have come home to roost in Brussels. Well, Brussels was built off of the blood of murdered Africans. So the chickens have come home to roost and we need to understand what that's all about. Now this chart I want to take a minute with because I want to show you I don't have a pointer and I do my arm, I do have a bad arm, but I want to show you something. 33 BC is about the time, AD is about the time they said that this person called Christ died, right? 325 AD is when Constantine starts the uh, call for the Nicene Conference to start writing the Bible. It would take from 325 AD to 789 before you get a Bible. Now, I hope you all are listening to me. From 325 AD to 787 before you get a Bible. So all the African churches are operating. They are not operating out of this Bible. We only reference them as Christianity, because, but they're not called Christianity. This form that they're calling Christianity is what they copied from us. And so this period is called the seven great councils. The first one is called the Nicene Conference, the first Nicene Conference. Then you had the second Nicene Conference. Then you had the Conference of Trent. Then you had the second Council of Trent. And then you had three more conferences before in 787 you produce what is known as the Bible. And it isn't until 1054. Now Ethiopia has got churches all the way back there in the third century, the fifth century and so forth. You don't get until 1054 the Roman Catholic Church. You understand what I'm saying? And now the unchanged Orthodox Church, these are the ones that comes out of what we are now calling the Coptic Church uh, and, and part of what is being discussed at Nicaea over that period of time. And so the Catholic Church will come into being at 1054. And then they would begin immediately as soon as they, 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 they adopt our information, the first thing the crackers do is put together armies, 1139, a little more than 100 years. They put together armies to invade the so-called Middle East, Northeast Africa, and call these armies the Crusaders. The minute we give them some information, they flip that and come with their war machine. And so it isn't until the 15th century that we get the Reformation of Martin Luther that produced the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, and the Anglican Church. So they don't come about until the 15th century. All this time, Africans already practice in this tradition they call Christianity. You understand me? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so by 1517, you see what is called the Reformation. You know, that's, 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 that's Luther coming about and stuff. And then, of course, Henry of England uh, severed ties with the Roman Church and created around 1529 what is known as the Anglican Church, out of which comes the Episcopalian Church. So understand me, people. You can go and find these things online, but I'm at least opening the door for your research so you can begin to enlighten yourself to see how people have been bamboozling us. This is the same chart, but that's more complicated. I won't waste time on that. This is the same rendition of the same chart. And again, okay, this church is called the Hagia Sophia. This is the first great church of Christianity in the Western or the white world. It is the senior church of the Byzantian Empire. This is it today. The Hagia Sophia has been converted to a mosque after Salahuddin and his people took over the Christian world from them. And that's what these, when these minarets was added. It's no longer a church or a mosque at all. It's a museum in Turkey today that you can go and visit. And then we come to the great dog of the time, Constantine, Emperor of Rome, who started what we know as Christianity or white Christianity or Western Christianity. This is the dog that started it, not for the purpose of serving God with all that fantasy that we've been told. He creates this. He brings these Africans and other mixed race people together at, at, at the Nicene Conference. And the people, like I said, seven of them, um, uh, of the 10 people who are the initial group that's putting the thing together are Africans. And what he's trying to do, Rome has now conquered all of North Africa and all of what we call as the Middle East, 
part of Kemet. And so now he needs to find a way to calm the native down. What does he do? How does he create, with this massive empire that they've acquired by war, how do you create a common ideology, a common philosophy, where you can control the behavior of the masses? And that's why modern-day Christianity was created, and that was the intent of Constantine, and he has proven to be enormously successful. Christianity is more successful than the founder ever thought in terms of controlling the minds of human beings using mythology and metaphor out of the very history and anthology of the people he's trying to conquer. And we fell for it because we were forced to fall for it at that time from the butt of the sword and the spear and the arrow and then later by the brunt of the gun. This is a poor painting, but you can see that this is Constantine in the middle, and this is four of the black writers of the Bible. And uh, I wish there could be a better painting, but this, this is one of the old renditions. Somebody probably put this together around the 15th century. But it was the Pope before this Pope who was in Cameroon, West Africa in 2009, and the story was carried in um, um, News, I think Newsweek magazine, um, it was in the spring of 2009, and he said, he was saying, he, while the Pope was in Africa, he said to the people in Cameroon who was in the stadium, that of the ten people who wrote, who wrote the theology of the church, seven of those ten were Africans. So you shouldn't run from the church, because it's your church. He was doing a hard sell, but the cracker was telling the truth, because in order to get what he wanted, he had to tell the truth. And so we knew that, Dr. Ben and others have told us that, but we've heard it now from different sources. Now this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, built uh, by the Roman Emperor Constantine on the site believed to be uh, Jesus' tomb. Now this was not the site of no Jesus' tomb, because there was nobody named Jesus to have a damn tomb. But his mother, his mother went to Jerusalem, and the mother said that she had found the site where Jesus' tomb was. And so he came and built this church, which is this little thing right here. They built the bigger one around it today, but this is the original little temple he built for his mother over what is supposed to be the site of Jesus' tomb. And this is the, of course, the Holy of Holies in that space. And of course, this is the Vatican City um, headquarters in Rome and site of the Catholic religion located in Rome. And in the middle of St. Peter's Square is an obelisk, which is stolen from Kemet, from the front of that great temple in Luxor that I showed you earlier. Now, if, we, if our religion was so profane, and our way is so profane, why is this the centerpiece of, the, of St. Peter's Square, with a, uh, a, a crucifix of their God sitting on top of this African Tekanu? You know? But you have to understand, Vatican City is not a church. It is a nation state, and because all land owned by the Catholic Church everywhere in the world is a part of this nation state, Vatican City is the largest nation state in the world. The Pope is an absolute monarch. The Cardinals makes up his, his parliament and his government. The bishops are his ambassadors, and it goes on and on. They have their own armies. That's called the Jesuits. They have their own secret service, which is called the Black Pope, with their own intelligence network. They have their own currency, their own money, and they have their own banking system in Vatican. So you're looking at the Holy Roman Empire still existing today and is known as the Catholic Church. Another look at St. Peter Basilica. This is the inside of the Basilica. This is the Holy of Holies. That's the Holy of Holies from a distance. It's full of things they've stolen from us. And I thought I'd throw this in. This is a statue of St. Peter, the man who was supposed to be working with the teacher that they call Christ. And they got a statue of him, but they got him as a black man with nappy hair. And they change his clothes often on all the holidays. And then this is St. Paul. They got him as a black man with nappy hair. So what, what else are they lying to us about? This is a, a Christ in the Metropolitan Cathedral in Mexico as a black man. This is the black Madonna in Barcelona on, the, on the, the left and the one in Mexico on the right. 
This is the Black Madonna in Lauren, Italy, being carried through the streets. And this is the confusion we in. How that happened? Here we are in the Congo carrying some cracker woman around, Damn. and the crackers, crackers walking around Spain carrying the black woman around. Oh, Ain't that deep? Damn. Ain't that deep, black folks? You know, but so we just got to study. We got to learn some stuff, see how people play with us, and then try to play us. Uh oh, they go Pope Francis kneeling down with the other Pope, praying to the Black Madonna as they exchange power in the Vatican. That, that's in the basement of the Vatican. And here goes another pope, the one before this pope, the one who died, I think this is John, yeah, praying, John to the black, praying to the black Madonna in, in the basement. And then here's Pope Benedict um, at a crowd at the shrine of Our Lady of Czestochowa in Poland, the black Madonna. Oh, man. And then here's Pope John Paul and Our Lady of Vansky in St. Nicholas Church in Kiev, Ukraine. That's deep. And then Pope Francis, who everybody seemed to love, this little uh, father of modern genocide of African people. Take credit for the millions you've killed in the Congo in the name of your Belgian church. You know, Pope Francis and the Black Madonna. When he comes in, they say, we got, we've been lying. Now we got to tell you the truth. Here, worship the black woman. We're giving it to you. So, you know, what, what, what's the deal? What's the deal, black folks? Then and now, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, ancient Ethiopia, and today, the European people today. How our stuff has gone from black as black over to white. So how do we take our stuff back? And this is an 18th century painting by a European uh, depicting Mary, Jesus, and Joseph arriving in Egypt during the said festival. Um, and, and, and the celebration of the birth of the Son of God, Heru, born of Immaculate Conception. So you can see the Egyptians, who they flipped and made the Egyptians white, and then made the servants and the slaves black, and then got the Egyptian worshiping a set and Heru, what we would call the said festival, which was they call Christmas, but it shows them in the forefront coming in with their new idea with the white mother and the white child and the father. This is what's coming into being, and the African worship of the black Madonna and child is going out of being. Uh, Tony Browder gave me this photo. I forgot the name of the artist who did it. And as you can see in the background, the great temple at Luxor, you know. But white folks showing you that they know the truth. They know the truth. They know the black Madonna and child, and they know the said festival, which we, they call Christmas, is already being worshipped. And here they come with their rendition of it. And they changed the, the, the Egyptian from being black folks, make us slaves, and then make the Egyptian white folks. Crackers are deep. Their deception is, is, is like rogue. You know, these are mental warriors at the highest level. Psychological genociders. And of course, we got St. Maurice, the patron saint of Germany. They don't tell you about Maurice. You don't get no blacker than Maurice. Again, you got St. Maurice with one of their saints. And, and so what I've been trying to show you that what this thing they call Christianity is just stolen black stuff. The thing they call Judaism is stolen black stuff. It's just fragments from the periphery of your system. The thing they call Islam is fragments from the periphery of your system. A good book, by the way, to look at the Islam piece is called El Jahiz. And you can buy it at Barnes and Nobles. It's called Al Jahiz. It's one volume, but in the one volume it has nine small books. It's written in the 8th century Iraq. And the most important book in there is the book called The Superiority of the Black Race Over the White, written in 8th century Iraq. He talks about the Prophet Muhammad as being black. He talks about the companions of the Prophet being black. He talks about one of the black women who were leading the medical corps of Muhammad's army. You got to read this stuff. Or you can read Ibn Khaldun, Philosophy of History, which is written, I guess Khaldun is writing around the um, 10th or 11th century in North Africa. And you begin to see how people just stole our stuff and then come back at us in this abusive manner. So this is the end of the presentation. But I just wanted to open a door that we can engage in another kind of dialogue 
So even with our brothers and sisters who are in the churches, um, we can approach them in a different way. I think um, we need to move away from this abusive, attack, antagonistic approach and try to find common ground using our history to bring our people back to the original uh, format, to the original thesis, to the original presentation of, of the wisdom that our ancestors have put together. Because the majority of our people are in these Christian churches, they're in these temples. If we say we are freedom fighters, we can't, who are we liberating? You know, whose freedom are we fighting for? Because the handful of us who are doing this teaching, we can't lead the, the, the more than two billion Africans. We've got to try to get them to understand their reality to understanding their history. And I think once they get into understanding their history, understanding their culture, understanding their philosophy, so they can understand that we already believed in reincarnation. Reincarnation was a big part of our way of understanding our spiritual essence, that um, we understood sacred science, we didn't operate from a belief system. We operated from a scientific, you must know system. And much of what they call science in the West is simply the Western grasping of the African spiritual understanding of nature and the cosmos. And so I'm going to bring this thing in. Um, I hope I've given you something. I hope Sanetta has and given me an opportunity today to speak to brothers and sisters that you go follow up on my research and help me get better at it and inspire yourself to do even better things with it. Right. But again, I want to just remember one more thing. Remember, I do have a PayPal account. Yes, yeah, say that. That is C small 1926 at AOL.com. C small 1926 at AOL.com. Um, any little bit helps. Um, we out here doing what we're doing. And like I said, I, I make a lot of mistakes. Um, I discover new things every day. Like Malcolm said, you got to learn something new every day. I've been lecturing and teaching for over 50 years. Now that I'm in my 70s, I'm cool with that. I'm just trying to keep on doing it. And when I make a mistake, I'm not a punk. I'm not scared of, of saying I made a mistake. Um, but nobody's going to make me back up or back down. Even at this old age, I will defend the integrity of my being, both physically, intellectually, and spiritually. So I hope the world understands that. Secret to life is to have no fear. All right. Um, we're going to take a few callers. Peace and Black Power, what's your name and where you call it from, sir? Peace and Black Power. This is Michael Edwards calling out in California. Brother, can you hear me clearly? Yes. yes. What's up, Mike? What's happening? How you doing, Dr. Smalls? How you doing, my brother? I'm good, my brother. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing well. Doing well. I called because I'm looking at a wise man on the screen, so I called to ask a question and yes, then sir. see, you know, I wanted to get some advice on something. Yes, sir. Okay. I know you've been around for a while and you've seen a lot of things, progress as, as it relates to the black community and politics as it relates to the black community. Yes, sir. I want to get your opinion on... If it's if it's even worthy of an undertaking, embarking on an undertaking, to seek to create a black party politically, not a community activism group, but a black party party that votes our own self interests only. Hmm. If, brother, do you think that's a possibility? Brother, brother Michael, let me be very clear. One of my great teachers and the person I love so much, Malcolm X spend most of his life fighting to try and establish a black political party. Yes. And many of our great leaders have been trying to establish a black political party since the 1900s. Right. We have not been successful because each time we try to really make the move, they stack things against us. And sometimes our own infighting and ignorance and ego stack the deck yep. against us. Because, you know, we were trying to do the Freedom Party here in New York. And even before that, um, Joe Mack and, and Amos Wilson was trying to push together a party. But you have other blacks who are from the Pan-African and nationalist and radical element, and everybody want to come up with, you got to have the perfect model. No, first we got to get a damn party. And then we can, we can call it and, and fix it. But all what a party means is that we have a tool and an instrument to elect to office 
the people who will utilize the, 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 the office of government and the monies that are there to come back to communities to help us. Right now, we've got a party that we're participating in that is controlled completely by the Jews, though the black makes up the largest number in the party, meaning the Democratic Party. And so we're not getting any residuals from it. It is their party, and we are their cannon fodder when they want to win office and handle and misuse and manipulate capital and, and development for their communities and not for ours. And I tried to reach out to some of my brothers, I'm not going to call their names, and I wanted to have a talk, um, some of the young brothers who are out here being very strong, about how we can say to these people running for office this year, right on and say, here is our agenda. Who's willing to carry our agenda? If you're not willing to carry our agenda, you're not going to get our votes. And we need some written understanding and agreement. But while we're doing that, we need to be organizing to put into being a black political party that we take from the local creation to a national level so that we can be able to seat in offices those persons that will operate around our interests and if they don't, they get one term, if not worse, in office. That's it. That's beautiful, Doctor. And I'm telling you, man, I'm, I'm soaking up like a sponge. You know what I mean? Now, now I want to just say this. Do you have any sources where we can, you know, because our black people are into this, you know, scholarship thing in our history, which is great. Yes, but can you offer us some sources? Me, and even me, myself, man, because I'm doing the research on this. Um, some of the works to, to, you know, people be hard on them because Wesley is a little parochial in terms of, you know, his being in the nation. I love the nation. I love Wesley. But Wesley Muhammad has done some good research. Some good research. Don't poo-poo it because his religion may be different or people may disagree with the minister. Look at the research the young man have done. The other is um, Dr. Ben's work. Dr. Ben has written a piece on Africa, Mother of Western Religions, I think is the name of it. That book I used to use in my class will blow your mind even today. And then there's the brother who wrote the um, Historical Origin of Christianity and the historical Walter Williams, uh, Walter Williams Professor. The histori Professor Williams, the Historical Origin of Christianity and the Historical Origin of Islam. And what I'll do, I have some more stuff on, on Judaism that I would um, give to Sarnetta and he can later put it out there um, for persons to get. But the book I didn't mention was that one book um, by um, Brother Jahiz from the 8th century Iraq, this black man, writes nine short books, which we would call essays today, but you can buy it at Barnes & Noble. It's called Al Jahiz, or uh, if that's not quite the name, it's Al Jahiz. Um, but he, he is powerful because he tells us in the first person, he's there writing about what's happening at the beginning of Islam. Mm. And he's telling us what's going on. Um, there's another book, um, Ibn Khaldun, Philosophy of History by Ibn Khaldun. And then I recommend to everybody, get Herodotus Book 2 mm -hmm. and read it. Most of us sometimes make reference to Herodotus, but we've never read the work. Read Herodotus Book 2. He pulls the cover off the whole Greek thing. You got to read it. And you find that even Europe is named for the granddaughter of a pharaoh. You know? I mean, we could take everything Big back. Classic. Right? They got all nothing. five books. I think five or six in one. Yes, sir. You one. Yes, sir. So, and I appreciate that. And I'm, I, like I said, I'm doing this research on the political thing and unity as far as the bottom foundation because that's what our people need. Our people like to get ahead of themselves. We've got to we about changing the monetary value in the country. We don't have a political party yet. We, 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 we live in America. We live in America. And we're almost 60 plus million strong. And we're not going to leave. So we need to stop mm -hmm. playing with ourselves. All if right. we're going to live that's here, right. then you better get in the game. Otherwise, you're going to be played mm. by the game. Go ahead. That's right. All right. Thank you, my brother Michael Edwards. Bye, man. Appreciate Thanks for you, calling man. in. No doubt, my brother. Bye. All right. Um, any more callers out there? Let's go. Let's go.
All right, let me call this person because he wanted to get in. Yes. All right, that's some powerful information right there, brother. Hello. All right, peace and black power, my brother. I seen you trying to call in. I called you back. Um, we live on the air. We got Professor James Smalls right here in front of you. What's your name, my brother? My name is Chris, and I've been trying to speak to you for the longest. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, hear sir. you loud and clear. Yeah, brother Chris. Perfect, perfect. First of all, I just want to say I appreciate you, uh, Samantha, man. You've been doing a lot of good for the community. Thank you very much, bro. Thank you. And, uh, um, and I forgot my question. Uh, Take your time, Chris. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, I'm about to call back. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> All right. Peace and Black Power, what's your name and where you calling from? Hey, this is uh, Sick the Black Falcon, son. That is peace. What's good, man? Peace, my brother. You have a question for the professor? Uh, yes. Now, uh, Professor Smalls, I know you don't know me as Sick the Black Falcon because I be doing my rap thing. Yes. But uh, you, you probably do know me as Wally Octave. Me and you have had several conversations. You even gave a consultation to me and my dad about his uh, Agent Orange and stuff. Okay, and yes, I just sir. Want to say yes, peace. sir. So, uh, also, I wanted to know, I'm probably going to be getting married here pretty soon, and I wanted to know if you've ever done any weddings or if you ever, uh, if you do them at all, and if so, how can we go about contacting you for your services to help perform this ceremony? Okay. Yes, I, I had stopped doing weddings, but I did two in the last two years. I did one for one of the leadership in the red, black, and green movement down in Charlotte. And then I just got through a month ago doing one for one of my former students out in Las Vegas. Um, so I'll be happy if we can work out a schedule. I'll be happy to perform the wedding. Now, I don't, I guess by then, because I have to re, you know, when I was over the mosque and I had my corporate credentials, I have to re-credentialize myself. So what I've done with some of the weddings, I've done it in partnership with um, either sometimes with a Muslim brothers and sisters, sometimes with a Christian who is registered in that jurisdiction. Now, where do you live? Uh, I'm out here in Las Vegas. You, you in Vegas? I just left Vegas. Yeah. I did Brother Frankie. Uh -huh. um, you know Brother, um, what's Brother Frank's name? Uh, Franklin. Frankie G. Okay. Yeah, I did Frankie G's wedding about three weeks ago. Oh wow! Yeah, I do. I do live out of here in Vegas, uh, but uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be held in Arkansas or possibly Minnesota. More likely to be Little Rock, Arkansas. If we do. Okay. So what? What's your date? What date do you have in mind? <clears throat> Uh, well, we wanted to try to work something out with, we didn't know what your schedule was. We were trying to kind of working around that before we even came up with any dates. But uh, now that we know you're open, um, I don't have, I have you on oh. Facebook. So that's well, the only well, way I can take, reach out take, to you right now. Take my phone number. I, I don't mind putting my number out there. I like for people to call. That's the only way I can talk to you. You know how to reach me. You got a pen? Uh, let me find one really quick. Yeah, we've talked several times. I remember when I, I uh, the first time yeah. we ever spoke was about that. I was trying to give you advice on setting up that uh, GoFundMe yes. a while back, a few months ago. Yes, sir, and it was very helpful because I raised the, uh, about 6000 plus on for the hotel. So thank you. Oh, again. wow. I remember when we were talking and you only needed like, uh, not, you, you, got, you raised like double that. That's awesome. Yes, sir. All right, I'm ready, sir. All right, it's 914. Nine one four nine six zero nine six zero two six two six nine three. You know, and if we can work out a date, because I'll be moving in and out of Africa a lot over the next four months, I'll be happy to to perform the wedding. I actually enjoy doing the wedding. Um, I do it very traditional African style, um, but again. What even mm -hmm. some of what the Christians call their style, they took that from us too. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's good to know your own thing, so you don't throw your stuff out thinking you're throwing their stuff out. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right. So we want nothing but African at this point. That's well, it. Well, we'll 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 break it down and we'll talk over it and we'll get to where you want to be. And I'll be honored. I uh, really it. really appreciate it. Okay, my brother. All right. Thank you, my All man. Right. 
Peace. Peace some black power, y'all. Peace, brother. Peace some black power. Yeah, that's that's a good thing right there. That's a good thing. Yeah, what up? Yes, I'm good. Because I'm on a conference call right quick. All right. That's the wifey calling in to check on me, make okay. sure I'm good. Right. You know, I ate and everything. Yes, no, <laughs> she that's, always check on me. That's, that's why she's my baby. Wife. That's my baby. That's right. All right, come on, family. We ain't got that much time. Call in. This is it. Yeah, because I got to go pick up my grandbabies. Peace and Black Power family. What's your name? Where you calling from? RCL. Hey, what's up, Sonette? What's happening? Uh, Professor Small? Yes, sir. Peace and blessings. How you doing, Professor Small? I'm good. I'm good. How you doing? I've uh, developed a website called ConsciousCommunity.com. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, uh, it's a, uh, a social community site that emphasizes uh, in helping us come together and get organized in uh, political and economic. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, wanted to ask you about sitting on one of the boards that we have for the elders. Uh, does that sound like something you might be interested in? I would be interested, but I'm spread so thin in so many things. I don't want to take a responsibility I can't meet. Okay, well, the, well, the elders only come in for special meetings anyway. So we, it wouldn't call for you. It would probably be maybe once a month. Even and, it's me, on, and it's online. Okay, well, I, I, let's, you, did you get the telephone number I just put out? Um, uh, no, uh, if, you, if you say it now, I can get it from you. Okay. 914-960-2693. Um, because I have a, a, you know, this hotel in Ghana and it takes up my 24-7. I've okay. got 22 grandkids and a bunch of them live with me and they take up another piece of that 24-7. I got a wife of the last 46 years and she demands a lot of my attention now because over these 40 some years I've given it to the community and not to her and I'm not gonna let her in her older age suffer without having a husband um, so I'm just laying that out um, they, those will be my priorities in terms of time and um, plus any other work I work with a group in my community called the gathering of black men and we do a lot of things that you're mentioning. So I would, we would talk over, and if, it, and if it works, I will tell you I would be willing to do it as long as you can appreciate that the demand of my time may be heavy and there'll be sometimes I can't come to concert. It, it, that's perfect because it's designed around that. All right. We, we, yes, we're, we're electing, uh, we have, we've got uh, upcoming elections. All right, hey brother. Um, I got a long list right here. You got you got his number. You have to call him later on. All right. Yeah, call, call, all right. Call me in the evening. Thank you, brother. Nine thirty. I know that. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. What I want to say, family, we got um, we got five hundred and two people in the in the room. Please give a donation to our brother Smalls. He already done um, gave you his PayPal email. Say it again, my brother. I want you to say it again. Yes. Say it again. C S M A L L nineteen twenty six at AOL dot com. Now that's your PayPal email. PayPal email. Is there any other way? Cause somebody wrote in there, I don't have PayPal. Is there any other way that they can make a tribute to you? A donation? Um, I got PayPal, I've got a... hmm. No. Okay. No. Um... Well you got his number, family. You can always give him a call, ask him how could I send you a money order or anything. I want to, hopefully this can inspire other people. I want to make the first crispy donation to my brother Smalls. Wow. $100 to my brother. going to buy gas for me all week. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I got to donate to you, brother. You know, yeah, always, man. That. I appreciate that. You know, hopefully that, that could um, encourage other people to, you know, make their little donations. Whatever you have, a dollar family. Five dollars, ten dollars, twenty, it's all good. We we accept it all. This right here helps him to travel 
back and forth to Africa, to Ghana, to um, across the world. You see, because he's bringing this um, information back to us. He has been working with us for over 50 years. Yeah. You see, he wasn't going to clock in. And I'm not knocking anybody who have a job working for the white man. Right. You got to pay your you got bills. It, you got it, we you got never it. knocked that. Yeah. What I'm saying is this brother been working for us for over 50 years. So we have to support our elders now going in and out, bringing this information back to us. So that's all I wanted to say on that, brother. The, the summer is going to be an extraordinary phenomenon if I'm able to do it all financially. But I want to, I'm going to be in Sudan for two weeks. Okay. I'm going to be in Kemet for one week. I'm going to be in Ghana for two weeks. I'm going to be in Congo for a week and a half. And I'm going to be in Angola for a week and a half. Now, in the Angola, Congo, we've been invited, um, me and some priests out of the UK, um, we are uh, being invited by some traditional priests and priestesses in Congo and in Angola to spend a little time understanding their system. Um, so that's an enormous trip. I'm going into Sudan with the Sudanese family. And when I was uh, ordained an imam back in 1967, one of the brothers that sat on the council that chose me as the imam over Malcolm's mosque, um, Brother Osman, who is Sudanese, he's one of my elders now, he's traveling with me to Sudan mm -hmm. so we can go to some of the ancient Nubian uh, uh, digs and pyramids and stuff, and as well as the, the great karma civilization. And then we'll stop and, and with Tony Browder, the dig he's doing in Egypt at the, the tomb there. And then I have my own tour that I do to Ghana for two weeks. So I've got them passing through Egypt so they can pick me up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on the 23rd, and we'll spend one day in Egypt touring the pyramids and the Sphinx, and then we'll go into Ghana for a two-week tour, and I'll be performing along with the King of Esokado a wedding, um, a recommitment of vows for a couple from Maui, brothers and sisters were married 21 years, but they want to go to Africa to reconfirm their, their vows. Um, so that's going to be a beautiful summer, and a lot of this depends. I'm scuffling to make sure I got enough money to buy these tickets and do what I got to do. Right. And take the film and do the research in order to bring it back here to you. All right. Peace and Black Power. What's your name and where you call it from? Hello. Um, my name is Rose and I'm calling from Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. Hi, Rose. Yes, so I just had not really a, well, really a question and also like a suggestion. Um, I'm a mom and my son is one and lately I have really been thinking of homeschooling him. Mm -hmm. So it just came across my mind, you know, just like any regular school, you know, they have online courses mm -hmm. if you don't want to go to the actual building. So I was thinking, you know, you guys, you know, Sinetta TV, Brother Polite, you know, any, everybody else around you guys. If it's possible for you guys to come up with like some type of on online courses, a website, or you know something like a curriculum for everybody else that wants to homeschool their children and don't really know how to go about it or exactly well, the right step. That's so, okay. so, mm -hmm. Take my number again, nine one four. Nine one four. I already. Ha I actually do have you your have number. It. I just saved call, it. Call me in the evening after nine. Mm -hmm. I will give you the number of Sister um, Oforiwa down in D.C. And she's a part of a homeschooling network. Mm. Okay. Good. And she'll be able to help you with almost anything you need to know. Okay, that sounds great. And just to confirm your number, you said 914-966-2693. No, 960-2693. No, 914-966-2693. Okay, yes, ma'am. All right, then. Thank you very much, guys. You Thank guys you. Have a good day. Call me All after right. 9 p.m. Peace and Black Power family. What's your name? Where you call it from? Hey, this is uh, Ricky from Chicago. Ricky, hey, pretty Ricky is you know. what they call you. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I want to ask Dr. What's up, my brother? Uh, I want to ask Dr. Small, can he uh, tell me the significance of the Egyptian beard? Because a lot of them had that long beard. And also... What, what does he think about Elijah Muhammad teaches as far as the tribe of Shabbat? Do you think that is correct or not? All right, speak on that for me, Dr. Small. Thank you. Yes, sir. First, I, I can't tell you about the, the beard. You're going to have to reach out to Brother Reggie on that. 
um, of all the people that I know that's into that kind of symbolism, Reggie is probably the best learned um, on the beard. I see it as a symbol of wisdom because, of course, the ancient ancestors would have been the elders and a beard would have been a part of their aesthetics. But I wouldn't want to tell you that that is the reason why they did it. You need to speak to a brother who's been studying the Meta Nature, um, Brother Reggie, Ashwa Brother Empadishi, Brother Ashwa Kwesi. These are brothers who have put a lot of time into those types of symbols. Um, as far as the nation of Islam, I think the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is probably the most appropriate Islamic approach for African American peoples who are involved in Islam. I think he was on the money and, and the way he interpreted and the way he approached learning Islamic development, it made common sense and truth is about common sense. The tribe of Shabazz, I don't really, I've done a lot of study in trying to find the source of that and I've not been able to find it and I tend to think the tribe of Shabazz is a metaphor for the African race. Um, that's the best, I think it's a metaphor for the African race. We know the word African isn't our most ancient label. Uh, we have many labels. People call us Moors, people call us Nubians, people call us Kushite, people call us Bantu. But none of them is the original name. People call us the Anu. Um, so Shabazz, I think, was a reference back metaphorically to the race as a whole. You know? Okay. That's um, the best I could do. Uh, someone texts me. I don't have their name. I just got their number here. But someone texts me and says, Ask Professor Smalls why do Israelites act like they not from Africa when it clearly started in Ethiopia? Well, that's a sad part. A lot of my best friends, one of my business partners, a Hebrew Israelite sister, but she's on it in terms of our African centered understanding. Um, the brother who manages our hotel in Ghana is a priest, a Kohen, and a rabbi in the Hebrew, African Hebrew tradition. And he's African conscious. He listens to Sonetta, he's probably on it right now. That's why I can reach him over in Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many of our people who have been misinformed by the Hebrew leadership. Um, you've got to go back and study their tradition in this country and study Reverend Matthews, who's someone who was a good friend of Malcolm and someone I got to know and respect. But there was a certain period of the development in this country where many of them went along with the Jewish community, went to Germany, and studied under the Jewish rabbis and came back with that rabbinical tradition which was not a part of the original Hebrew tradition whereas the Kohen tradition or the Kohen tradition, the priest tradition was the major part of that tradition. So I th it's just being unconscious of their history and misinformed because even the area that they called Jerusalem or Israel or Palestine that's Northeast Africa and everybody that lived there was black folks as I showed in my presentation, one sculptor of a Canaanite woman, as black as she can be. And I could have shown other sculptors of, of even the original Persian or Iranian, black as they can be. And so it's just the misinformation and, and, and the colonizing of our mind by white supremacy in terms of how we see our images in the world and how we locate ourselves in the world, both psychologically and geographically. And I think the work that everybody's doing here, I think the debates are helping to turn this around. I think the discussions that's on Sonetta TV and some of the other things I've seen in the, the African Senate and the conscious community, the red, black, and green community, I've seen a lot of advancement and understanding coming about with the new knowledge and new information. All right, last questions, because you got to get on that. You, yeah, you don't want to get caught up in traffic. Right. All right, Peace and Black Power family, what's your name and where you call it from? <clears throat> Yo, my name is Jay from Cleveland, Ohio. All right. Hey, brother Jay. Peace, brother Smalls. Peace and uh, blessings. This is not not so much a uh, question. I just wanted to reach out to brother Sinetti. Um, in the beginning of the video, uh, you talked about you needed a different uh, laser pointer. I wanted to know what color do you need, and I was willing to get it, send it out to you, brother. Yeah, I think green would work better on the screen than the red. Okay. The green would get less absorbed. 
Um, text me. You got a P.O. box? No, no. This is my number here. Text me when okay. the show is over, and then I can give you the information you need. All right. Thank you. Anything I can do to help, man, I just want to, you know, do my part and uh, help out the family whenever I can. Yeah, that's, All right. That's how a revolution is won, brother. That's Thank you, my man. That's how a revolution is won. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Brothers, brother, Thank you. All right. Peace and Black Power family, what's your name? Where you calling from? Hello, sir. Yes, what's happening? Hey, what's up, brother? It's uh, me, uh, Omar. What's up, Omar? Hey, uh, is everything was right from yesterday? Just checking to make sure everything was all right. Uh, you know we live streaming, right? Oh, you live streaming right now? Yeah. yeah yes, sir, brother. Uh, what's up, man? How's everybody doing? I got Professor Smalls right in front of you right now. What's up? Oh, Professor Small, peace, brother. How you doing, man? Peace, brother Omar. How you doing? I'm good, brother. I'm good, good man. Good. What's going on with you guys, man? Everything's all right? Yeah, I thought you was calling in to ask a question, man. Uh, no, nah, I didn't even know you guys was on live stream and stuff or whatever. Uh, what were you guys talking about? I don't mind. Oh, my. Well, we ain't got time to talk about that now because yeah. we're closing up. But you can always go back to the video. The video will be up on my channel. And... um. Um, call me and call me back in like about maybe 20 minutes. Well, I want to recommend. Okay, I'll call three, back in 20 minutes. Hold on, hold on. I just want to recommend three books for the brothers and sisters who have been with us and listening. One is Dr. Ben's book, Black Man of the Nile and His Family, is a must read, brothers and sisters. The other is our young brother out of out of UK, um, his book When We Ruled. Um, um, brother Rob, Robin, what's Robin's last name? Robin. Oh God! When we rule. When we rule. Mm. Um, but the, that's the type. With the title, you find the book. When we rule, and then by all means, check unto Diop's civilization or barbarism. Civilization or barbarism. Civilization or barbarism by check unto Diop. When we rule by um, Brother Robin. Oh Lord, what's Robin's name? And then Dr. Ben's Black Man of the Nile and his family. If you can absorb in the next year those three documents, it, it, it will just knock the doors open all over the place. And get a copy, and you can go online and get a copy of Herodotus Book 2. Herodotus Book 2. The other piece that everybody should have in their library is the eight volume set of UNESCO History on Africa. Eight volumes, the UNESCO History on Africa. It'll just you you be studying the rest of your life. All right, last right. question. Right. Here we go. Peace and black hey, power. What's, what's your what, name? What, Where you calling on, from? Uh, this is your brother. Hey, Rue. How y'all doing? Today? Hey, Rue. Go ahead. Yeah, Start I'm, over I'm again. Go ahead. The question. The question was: They had a guy from ESPN, and he was mentioning yeah uh, to Sinetta about the the popes that was uh in Rome in ancient times. Uh -huh. Basically, my question is short and sweet. Were these dudes pushing the white Jesus or was they pushing the black Messiah? Because, you know, as we know nowadays, they got Negroes with European minds. So I want you to go ahead and just, you know, add live off of that. Well, remember, the, the, the white, we don't get a paintings of, of the, the Messiah and the mother and the child until the 15th century as whites. So it isn't until the 15th century you get these white imagery. And it's not inappropriate. White people should see God in their image. The problem is when we stop seeing God in our black image and begin to see God in our white, in white image, which is the image of our murderer, our rapist, our robber, our enslaver, our oppressors. That does something to injure the spiritual psyche and to violate, operate almost as a profanity on our soul. You see? It's not natural. I, I get that. And I want to make it harsher natural. than it's not natural. It is profane to our very soul to do that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I, so, I got so, that. So, the, and some of those popes were even African men. They weren't concerned so much with the images as they were concerned with the principles, concepts, and ideas that would instruct and inform the human mind on how to organize itself and organize its mate and organize its family and its extended family to live in a communal, collective, cooperative, harmonious, balanced environment with the rest of nature and the cosmology. That's what this thing is supposed to be about. 
images are just teaching tools in that process. Right, 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 correct. Okay. So, and I, I knew it was going to go back to the beginning, and, and, and a lot of people, they want to start us off yes. where Israel starts. No, 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 no. That, I knew it was deeper it, than it, that. It, hey, it, Professor, it, hey, yeah. I just want to let you know before you keep expounding, man. I've been following you ever since you had long hair, man, and when oh, you was doing man, the classroom settings. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and I, I, I love your warrior spirit, but I just want you to know, I want you to keep up with the good works, man, because I, I, I watched the lecture and I really enjoyed it today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's about us trying to help one another get at the truth so that mm -hmm. we can be clear um, that we are spirits in transition. I have, Without a shadow always, of a I have always lived. There have never been a time when I wasn't. When we read Correct. the pyramid text and Amun says, I created myself out of myself, I was a part of the essence of Amun when that statement was being made. I will always live. These formation of elements from the earth that we call the body, which will go back to dust once the water is absorbed out of it, um, is not me. It is a part of me, but it is the dwelling place for the real me. I've always been here. You've always been here. And that's what history does. Once you're able to tap back into history, begin to understand it, and then to connect with your ancestors, you know what you're going to realize? Is that you are your ancestors. And when you have children, what you're doing is simply having yourself. You're creating another version of you to go forward in the future because this version in this container can no longer continue the journey. So, so we being a, a basically an amalgamation of all of our predecessors, all of our ancestors. Yes. Sir. So basically, saying we always been here we as always, we are now. We always been. We are an expression of an aspect of the divine essence having the human experience. All right. That's that, beautiful. I'm that's beautiful. That's powerful. Hey, thank you, Sarnetta, man. Black yeah. power, man. Black power, brother. So I'm going to have right, to say brother. Hotep. No. I'm going to have to say Odabo to all of my brothers and sisters who all are right. tuned in. And hopefully me and uh, Sarnetta can do this again as spontaneously yes. as we did it today. All peace, right. Peace, peace and black power, family. Thank you all for tuning in. Another classic. Your brother Sarnetta is um, 